Hosanna. Scripture says several times in the Psalms, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And certainly we have been blessed beyond what we deserve. We want to express this Memorial Day weekend our thanks to those of you and your families who have served and our armed forces. In fact, I had planned for us to have a little special prayer time for the uh, search process this morning. I'm going to move that to next week. And um, we, want to, we want to acknowledge in both services those of you that have served in our armed forces. Before I forget, this week is a week in which your search team is interviewing via Skype uh, three more candidates, and uh, they'll be doing that, I think, it's, uh, Isaac, is it Tuesday and Thursday evening? So at the same time that they are uh, doing those interviews, beginning at, are they at 7, Isaac? Uh, 7 o'clock. The Maranatha room will be open, and there will be an elder there to facilitate special prayer. It's 6, Tuesday, Thursday. So uh, from the beginning, I've been pleased that your leadership has taken uh, this whole process of calling a new pastor seriously first by the priority of prayer. And uh, they're looking at some really good names uh, moving along with the process. And so we certainly want God's man, God the one who opens doors that no man can close and closes doors that no one can can force open. I want to do this a little differently this morning. I want to acknowledge if in this first service, if we have some service personnel, but also any parents or grandparents or children of service personnel. So if you served in our armed forces, any branch, and uh, your extended family, would you stand up right now? We do want to say thanks to you. Oh, good. Yes. We thank the Lord for your service, and we appreciate you. <laughs> Amen. Now this morning, I want to talk about great church fights. You say, Pastor Jim, that sounds awfully negative. Are you aware of some fight going on? No, I'm really not. Uh, Pastor Jim, are you aware of some uh, potential fight that's about to go on? No, I'm really not. That's actually the reason why it's a good time for me to preach this message on how do we biblically turn controversy to victory. And as we go through the New Testament, I think you'll see that this is a significant theme in the Bible. Well, the old saying is, for me to love the world, no chore. My problem, the neighbor next door. So we know what the sweet by and by is going to be like, but the nasty now and now is sometimes filled with conflict. Now, here's the premise of the whole message, and you'll see that in the notes on the back of your bulletin. God uses disagreement and conflict when we deal with it His way. So let's just begin with the fact that even while the Lord Jesus Christ is on the earth, he selects these 12 special men to be among him. They're called disciples, which simply means followers. They'll later be called apostles, which means sent ones. And here is God in human form, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins that we might have peace with God. Romans says we have peace with God because of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is Jesus who was called the Prince of Peace. He came to bring peace someday to this old heavens and earth where he makes a new creation, uh, heavens and earth, in which there is perfect peace. But in the meantime... While he is walking along the dusty country of Galilee, his disciples are with him, and, and they're arguing. They're arguing who is the greatest. I could just picture this visually. Jesus is walking in front of the, of the bunch, and uh, Peter is saying, 
you know, in the kingdom, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be the big dude sitting next, you know. And uh, Andrews, no, wait a minute, what about me? And uh, they, they divide into their little groups, and they're having their argument, and uh, Jesus stops. He turns around looks at them and says, Hey, boys, what were you talking about as you walked along the way? This is in the Scriptures. What's not in the Scriptures, I can just see their reaction, kind of like, like teenagers, uh, nothing. Because they've been arguing about who is the greatest. The disciples of Jesus, with him present, had conflict. And Jesus takes the occasion to talk to them about being childlike in spirit. And that he would be first must be willing to be last. He that would be a leader must be willing to be a servant. He used the illustration of being a child because a child is dependent, not independent. A child has needs and has to submit to the feeding and the leadership and the protection of a parent. And so it is that if we're going to prosper in the Christian life, rather than think we can do it all ourselves or that we're the greatest, we, we need to be servant-oriented or childlike in spirit. It just strikes me that you only get a few pages into the New Testament of the Word of God and uh, disciples are arguing. And Jesus is going to teach them about humility. And blessed are the peacemakers. They're the ones that are characterized as the children of God. Well, um, you go to the, to the book of Acts, which is really kind of the gospel of Luke, part two. It's the continuing story of what God does through the church after the Lord Jesus died for our sins, rose again, ascended up into heaven. And um, in Acts chapter 6, we have lots and lots of Jewish people from all around the world that have gotten saved. Now when I say lots and lots, you need to understand that what had happened was that people had come, Jewish people had come from uh, what we call France and uh, uh, Persia over towards China and to the north and from Africa, they had converged on Jerusalem to celebrate the Jewish Old Testament feast. But in the process, they heard the apostles preaching, Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And what we read in the early chapters of Acts is thousands upon thousands upon thousands. And by the way, there were hundreds of thousands of these visitors in Jerusalem, Jewish people. Well, they, they hear Peter stand up and say, the one whom you crucified, God raised from the dead and is declared, declared to be the Savior and God. And their hearts were struck with the fact that their Old Testament system of rituals and rules prepared them to believe in Messiah, but it didn't take away their sins. And according to Acts chapter 2, thousands got saved. And then... Later on, several thousand more got saved. And then the church began to multiply, not just add, but to multiply. And every day, the book of Acts says, people were coming to Christ. Well, most of these people were Jewish people. Now, they normally would have taken off to go back to, to Ethiopia or, or to, to France or to Italy or wherever they were from, but they had come to meet Messiah Jesus. And now they're with these Christians. And every single day, the disciples, in the name of Jesus, are teaching. They're, they're, they're doing what we're going to do in a few minutes. They're celebrating communion, and they're remembering the death and the forgiveness of Christ, and that in Christ there's redemption through his blood. And uh, they celebrate his resurrection. They were doing it every day. And people were, were continuing to be saved. But now what happened is they stayed for weeks and weeks and weeks after this Jewish feast called Pentecost and they didn't have enough jobs for everybody. Jerusalem was pretty big about that 
time it was maybe a hundred thousand people or whatever, but now it's several hundred thousand people. And uh, how are these Jewish people that have become Christians, how are they going to eat and get along? The answer is share. The Christians are big on sharing. And God is big on multiplying and doing miracles. But now that brought about a problem, some tension, in which one of the ethnic Jewish groups thought that they were being mistreated. Here's Acts 6.1. In those days when the number of the disciples was increasing, and again, I've told you, maybe, maybe several hundred thousand saved. Wow. The Grecian, that's the Greek Jews among them, complained against the Hebrew Jews. And uh, their complaint wasn't, you're from a Greek background and I'm from a Hebrew background. No, th their concern was, we have widows among us and one group is getting more food than the other is getting. Well, it was a legitimate concern, though normally in the Bible, complaining is always wrong. You can talk to my wife Nancy, but one of the first Bible verses I remember her, her teaching to our children was, do everything without grumbling and complaining. I can remember the little kids toddling around the house. They couldn't even pronounce the words. They do everything without grumbling and complaining. I can, I can hear Andy saying that as Nancy taught them, don't complain. In the scriptures, complaining is a, a serious thing. It's always right to speak up on behalf of a wrong. It's, it's not wrong to bring attention to a legitimate need. But their problem was they complained. But this got the attention of the uh, apostles. And um, they said, you know what? If, if there's mistreatment or inequality here, we want to take care of it. So they got together and they said, we are so busy teaching the word leading people to Christ and discipling people, we need to have somebody else that can just give themselves to making sure that the widows, the orphans, and the poor have enough food. And so God gave them the idea of having deacons and deaconesses. The word deacon, diakonos, it simply means servant. There were male and female deacons, deaconesses, and they were simply ones that were charged of God to meet people's physical, financial, food, housing needs. And so what they did was they, they, they came up with this group of people that had proved themselves to be faithful and were godly, and they set about to meet the needs equally of the people that were hurting. It was the first deacon board and it became an example and a blessing to the unsaved world how that these Christians see how they care for one another what could have been a really bad fight ended up in a, a really neat establishment of not only people that are burdened day by day with the spiritual needs of people but that we want godly people who care for their physical needs as well well it's kind of significant to me that in the scriptures, the Bible does not hide the fact that even among significant key Bible leaders, there were at times disagreements. I um, probably should have put the scripture up here, but I'm going to read to you from Acts chapter 15 and um, verse 36 through 41. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. He, he didn't want to just evangelize. He wanted to follow up and disciple. Barnabas wanted to take John, who was also called Mark, with him. But Paul did not think it was wise to take him because he, that's John Mark, deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. Now let me stop and say, Paul is like, look, John Mark, he flaked out on this mission trip, he couldn't handle it, and he went back home. And uh, that's Paul, you know, full speed ahead. 
But Barnabas is buddy Barnabas. He's always a restorer. He's always a healer. It's good to have staff and elders that have differing temperaments and differing spiritual gifts so that we counter one another. And um, the truth is that John Mark had messed up and this concerned Paul, but later on, towards the end of the New Testament, Paul says, bring John Mark to me because he's profitable to me. Because he messed up, and Paul was upset that he messed up, doesn't mean that he was washed up and finished up and could never be used again. But here's two unique, strong leaders, Barnabas and Paul. Paul says, um, we're not taking somebody that flaked out on us before. And Barnabas says, yeah, let's do it. Now, I, I'm reading from verse 39. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, a little island. But Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. What happened was, as a result of this disagreement, there were two teams rather than just one team that proved being faithful. We understand that sometimes disagreements happen because we view things from different perspectives. And uh, the Bible's not hesitant to be right up front and say, this was a sharp disagreement among them. But being godly people, they chose other godly people to work with them, and much blessing happened. Once again, we see the Apostle Paul being upset when Peter, a little less strong in the faith, um, was being intimidated and on the verge of compromising the Gospels. So I'm reading from Galatians 2, verse 11. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. Now let me stop and show you what's happening. Paul has, or Peter has come in and he's preached to these people in a region called Galatia. Salvation is by grace through faith alone. He's taught that if, if salvation comes by anything that we do, Christ died in vain. Why did Jesus die on the cross if it's up to us to earn our salvation? And so scripture says grace by faith plus nothing equals salvation. One of the big points of the book of Romans is now to him who does not work but to him who believes on Christ who justifies the ungodly his faith is counted for righteousness I taught that to a group once and a man burst and he said you're you're telling these teenagers that they don't have to do anything to be saved I said that's right because the question of the New Testament what must I do to be saved Acts 16 30 believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. But here's the deal. The Jews had a very strict Old Testament diet. And um, Mexican pizza from 7-Eleven, no, not 7-Eleven, what I, Taco Bell, even though it's back on the menu now, it wasn't on the menu then. Diet Mountain Dew was a no-no. And they had these things that they didn't eat, like ham, no pig, whatever. And uh, they were very big on the fact that God has chosen us Jews to be separate. We eat a separate way. And um, Peter has led a bunch of these Jews to Christ. And now a bunch of Gentiles are coming in to hear the gospel. And uh, the, these old Jews are saying, but we've got to teach them not to eat just anything. They've got to follow our Old Testament rules. Now the truth is, all they had to do was follow Jesus. Jesus said that he declared all foods to be clean if they are accepted with thanksgiving. 
book of Hebrews says these Old Testament regulations, they were preparatory to teach us to be a different kind of people, Old Testament Jews looking for the Messiah, but now they are past because Christ has fulfilled this for us. But um, Peter was really intimidated by these Jewish leaders who said, we can't be, we can't be eating with these uh, Gentiles, even if they have become followers of the way, Christians. And uh, Peter, a good man of God, but sometimes vacillating. Uh, when he's up, he's really up. When he's down, he's really down. So uh, the story continues here in Galatians 2. Um, verse 11, uh, excuse me, verse 14. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile, not like a Jew. How is it that you force the Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. I, I, I was reviewing verses that I memorized 40 years ago when I became a Christian, and uh, that was one of them. Know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. So Paul goes on to explain, listen, it's not we're saved by grace and we're kept by works. We're saved by grace and we're kept by grace. And you're setting a false standard here that you're going to act one way with one group and act another way with another. And um, uh, Paul is to Peter, stop it. Just stop it. Now, to Peter's credit, he accepts rebuke. Here is one of the great measures of maturity. How do you handle it when somebody says something to you that's corrective instead of just a compliment? Here's one of our measures of our emotional and spiritual maturity. How do we handle loving rebuke or correction? And Peter, the man of God, accepts this and so the book of Galatians goes on to teach, yes, we're saved by God's grace. We will live by God's grace. We'll not use our liberty to offend somebody, but um, we'll not make it a part of our salvation, what we eat or how we dress or how we look. And a disagreement that at first looked very awful became a blessing to us. All right, uh, let me do one more just disagreement in the, uh, uh, in the epistles. Here in the book of Philippians, we have a disagreement between a couple of ladies. Some pronounce their names Eurodia and Syntyche. And let me read uh, again from Philippians 4. I grabbed the Bible that I often preach from, but, but the print is shrinking on it as I'm getting older. <laughs> Struggling a little bit with it. I've got I to gotta remember Nancy to bring my preaching Bible from home. Um, Philippians 4, verse 2. I plead with Eurodia, and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are written in the book of life. Now just imagine, you're in the early church, you're in this little city called Philippi, and you're meeting in a house church. They didn't have buildings like we have, they met in homes. And uh, there's been this tension between two of the ladies that were leaders in the church. We're not told, we don't need to be told what it is. We all know what it is to have been in tension at times uh, with people in our lives over something legitimate or illegitimate. But I can just imagine that the, the news comes, hey, there's a letter from Paul. So they gather 
at the house to do church. And they open this letter that God inspired that eventually is going to be called the epistle to the Philippians. And uh, they're reading along how Paul commends them for their love and the fact that, that Christ, who was God, humbled himself and came in the form of a man. They're encouraged that he says in chapter 2, the day's coming, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And then as they're sitting there listening, I picture Eurody on one side of the living room and Syntyche on the other. They hear, I plead with Eurota. And there's a little bit of nervous uh, reaction on Eurota's behalf and her family. And I plead with Syntyche. Oh, she goes. I plead with these two women whom I love in the Lord, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Get your disagreements behind you. He goes on to say, they are people that had served the Lord. They, they had been true companions in the gospel. Now settle whatever it was is dividing yourselves. It's an example not only of the reality that in the local church and in the broader body of Christ, we have differences at times. Sometimes they're sinful and not legitimate. Sometimes they are understandable and an issue of perspective. But out of this, Paul gives us the example of loving, clear correction. Proverbs says open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. And so Jesus taught that if somebody wrongs you, try to go to that person. It may be that you have to give them some time and some time to pray. It may be that um, face-to-face is too awkward, so you do it via email or a phone call. But they won't listen to you. But if, there's a serious difference. It's not just a matter of opinion or taste. There's a difference. So after you give them time and try to talk to them, well, find somebody godly to take with you. Preferably someone that's not intimidating to the person that you're in conflict with. Someone that they would be happy to talk with. And the three of you sit down and see if you can't work it out and take time to work it out. Love demands that we sometimes do this multiple times. Galatians 6.1 says you who are spiritual Seek to restore the person who is erring in a patient spirit of humility, considering yourself, knowing that you also can be tempted. Well, if people are divided over something that's significant, we're not talking about a preference of just culture or taste, but there's a problem, and they won't listen to you, and you give them time and prayer, and you take another godly person and they won't listen, then you have to take it to the church leadership and talk about that. And uh, I can just picture, I trust in my mind, that after Paul read this, Eurodia gets up from her side of the living room, and Syntyche gets up from her side of the living room, and they say, I'm sorry, and they hug one another, and the fellowship is all the sweeter. Now, Let me tell you that the background of most of the New Testament is correcting error and solving conflict. I can't go through 27 epistles, but uh, the book of Romans was written by Paul as inspired by God to make sure that people were clear that we are dead in trespasses and sins and we need God's life to bring us salvation. The book of Galatians, Paul has to write and say, I hear that you're biting and devouring one another. And he says, let there be peace. Ephesians was about some misunderstanding where their, their culture in Ephesus was uh, corrupting. And, and that was true of 1st and 2nd Corinthians. They were boasting about themselves and they were thinking they were hot stuff and God had to write to them about being one in Christ and humbling themselves. And, and, and First and Second Thessalonians, there were misunderstandings, even as there are today, about the return of the Lord. My point is, these blessed New Testament books that we have, letters called epistles, 
They were mostly written to correct error and to solve conflict because that's a reality. And we are the beneficiaries of them today. Now, why, why do we disagree? Well, this isn't brain surgery. We all know this. We have various backgrounds. I'm from Detroit, and all of you from Ravana are wrong. Actually, the ver- reverse is true. <laughs> but um, I, I'm from, I, I, I'm, I'm really, I love Michigan. I've been a mid-Michigander now for the majority of my life. But my, my background from the city of Detroit uh, is different. And I view things differently than some people. We all have various experiences. None of us in life have the exact same experience, but experience becomes the lens through which we look at life. It becomes the filter. And uh, therefore, when you have a disagreement with a person, ask the question, where is he coming from in his experience? Where is she coming from? Please hear this. If you don't hear anything that I say in the months that I had the privilege to be your interim pastor, please hear this. Everyone acts the way they do for a reason. And everyone is worth understanding. All right? Everyone acts the way they do for a reason. And everyone is worth understanding. We have various experiences. Okay, there's such things as called early adapters and late adapters. Early adapters want to go. Who? let's... You know, on, on the search team, we have early adapters and late adapters. I, I, I met with them the other night, and I'm just, you know, kind of looking at the different temperaments and the different backgrounds, and some are early adapters. Let's call this guy. And uh, somebody else says, no, but wait a minute, we got, we got four more to interview, <laughs> you know. Uh, and, and God gives to the church differing backgrounds, especially, and in marriage we see this, early adapters, late adapters. Okay, that's a, that's a Bible message all on its own, but I think we could add to the list here of reasons that we disagree. But can our disagreement be resolved in a positive way for good? So, some of you remember about 15 years ago there was a huge tsunami, this monster wave in Southeast Asia. And it swept over one little island, uh, actually ended up destroying the whole island, and it swept a baby hippopotamus to another island. Now this little hippo is like 12 weeks old. It's a baby. The tortoise is a centurion, 100 years old. I don't know that naturally there is much interplay or chemistry between a three-month-old hippopotamus and a hundred-year-old tortoise, but these guys became best buddies. And um, over the course of the years that that hippo grew up, the tortoise was the mama figure. Um, They slept together. They loved one another. They uh, traveled together. And I'm thinking, this is the weirdest combination, but the tortoise was lonely. And the baby hippo was needy. And uh, as a result of this tsunami, this terrible storm, we have a picture of the fact that in diversity, there can be unity. I just loved reading this story and uh, about how the island natives would would, uh, make sure that their needs were met, but mostly emotionally, They were meeting one another's needs. All right, let me close before we come to communion to the Lord's Supper. If you didn't pick up one of the little communion packs that are in the back and you can get them at any point. Um, There's an awful lot of Bible commands to consider about dealing with conflict. Romans 13 says, let us behave decently. Ought to be the characteristic of the church. Philippians 2.14, do everything without complaining or arguing. Ephesians 4.15, instead of being caught up in all kinds of silly stuff, it says, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow up unto him who is the head, even Christ. There's our job description, to speak the truth in love. Proverbs says, without gossip, a quarrel dies down. 
So if uh, Johnny and Susie have an argument and Johnny and Tony have an argument and uh, Johnny and Harry have an argument, there's a good case that Johnny is the source of the arguments. And the Bible says you, you, you pull the sticks out of the fire, the flame will die down. So it is without gossip, a quarrel will die down. Um, oh, this verse is just really convicting. Rebellion, uh, the one translation says, insurrection is as the sin of rich, witchcraft. To, to, to be a source of rebelling against the authorities that God has put in place. There's a way to deal with that. There's a biblical way to try to overturn and change the authorities that are in the police or in the church or in politics. But it is not by rebellion or insurrection. God says that's like witchcraft. Whoa, pretty serious thing. Brothers, I quoted this earlier. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself or you also may be tempted. Uh, I think this is my last one. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. This is some pretty strong language where Paul says, make every effort to be people that are at peace with one another. As the Holy Spirit has called us different backgrounds, different temperaments, different viewpoints, but to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Doesn't mean we always agree. It does mean that we're willing to work together. The church doesn't always have to be uh, unanimous in every decision. We do have to try to be sensitive to keeping the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Um, so for Ravana Baptist Church, right now is a time to seek God. I don't know whether God's going to send us a pastor in the next few weeks or if it's going to be months. What matters is that we seek God. That we pray, not my will, but yours be done, O Lord. That we make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace and that we glory in the cross of Christ. I told this uh, uh, story in one service before. Uh, two porcupines in Canada are huddling together to get warm, but their quills irritated each other. Shivering, they huddled and concluded, we needle each other, but we need each other. Hey, that's us, isn't it? Sometimes we needle each other, but we sure do need each other. So the Lord Jesus... On the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and he said, this bread represents my body. He often referred to himself as the bread of life. It was a symbol that as the bread is consumed, the nutrients, the life is gained. As Jesus would die, so we would gain. He said, this juice represents my blood. He actually said, this is my blood, but we understand it in the context of the symbolism. And when he did this, he goes all the way back to the Old Testament Passover in, in which God said, when I see the blood of the lamb slain, I will pass over you in judgment. Jesus picked that up in what we call the Last Supper and he applied it to himself. And then when the Apostle Paul taught about how we should do communion today, he, he didn't give us a lot of details of how often we do it, how we do it. People certainly observe communion legitimately in different ways. But he said, do this as often as you will and do it in remembrance of me. Here's what we call the Lord's Supper or communion is about. It's about... Jesus. And being thankful, the scripture says that in Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. 
And so let's take a minute to bow our hearts and be quiet before the Lord. Let's thank God for Jesus Christ and for His forgiveness. Father, you have said that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, first of all, we thank you for this bread that represents the nourishment of the life-giving Christ. And then we thank you for this juice that represents the precious blood of Christ in which there is forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen. Now again, if you didn't pick up one of the little COVID packs, uh, we're going to continue to use this for a little while, but eventually we're going to look forward to getting uh, to the place where we can observe communion with a little different format. If you didn't pick one up, just feel free to go get one now. You don't have to be a member of this church. You sure don't have to be a Baptist, but, but you need to be a follower of Jesus. And be grateful to remember him as you eat the bread in remembrance. And in the same way, 1 Corinthians 11 says, when he took the cup, he said, do this in remembrance of me. morning. you guys. It was good to worship together today.